Welcome to Really Know Really. You haven't liked and subscribed yet? Really? Do it, or the puppets get angry. Now here's Jason Alexander and Peter Tilden. You like doing this though, right? I do enjoy this. Yeah, you do. I you have honestly... met fascinating people because of you. And, and people, so. and not only have I met fascinating people, you've gone out of your way to introduce me via this podcast to people I have been really excited to meet. And today, we get to do that for you. Really? No, really. Really? No, really. Really? You've been talking about our guest. No, this really. is someone who sort of jumped off the screen for you and really caught your attention. And I see why. I've, I've now you know, watched you what it, she right? does. But um, th this is a really special right. comedian. And we, you and Huge I are both fans of, what, oh my of God. people that can spin comedy. And having been around comedians, and we've talked about it, I knew Carlin, Joan Rivers, of course. Yeah. Leanne Morgan, I watched her. Out of, no one suggested her comedy special. And she's Southern. And she just kind of... And I mean Southern, southern with a K. Southern, yeah. I and, mean, and, yeah. And she, she, you'll hear along, when she starts chatting with us. She chugs along... And when the special's done, I go, she's brilliant. And you don't realize she's brilliant right. because it doesn't look like she's working. Right. She it's, effortless. Work. Yeah. it's effortless. Yeah. So I'm dying to have her on. And the really no really here is she didn't really pop and make it until she was in her 50s yeah. and really 57. Yes. It's a, so, it's a late blooming career. I'm not saying a late blooming talent, but a late blooming yes, career. Yes, and she had opportunities. She'll tell you about that. But the fact that it's late in life and you will, I think everybody's going to love her. Her specials have gotten hundreds of millions of views. Netflix, top view, top view. And I'm so glad that you laugh. It's, you're not a hard laugh, but you're a discerning I'm laugh. a tough laugh. I'm an easy smile. I'm a hard laugh. I enjoy things readily. And she makes but you to laugh. really get me to laugh. And she makes you laugh. She, she makes me laugh. And there's something laugh. special. So I wanted to, before we get her on, though, we're going to talk about that. Because what, what the really no really for me is, and I know we discussed this, is all those people that you run across that go, you know, I'm so glad that I became big later in life. Because early I wouldn't right. really have, I have the wisdom later in life yes. to handle it. Yeah, I got to know about that, and we'll, we'll we'll ask her about that. And as relating to you, because you did get your big hit early in life in your twenties, you had your Tony. Uh, I was twenty nine. Yeah, so but we'll yeah, talk but about I but I started realizing dreams when I was a teenager. All right, so we're talking. You know, so I mean, I I made my professional debut when I was fourteen, and that was unimaginable. So. It started to be fed to me or very early. So how do you think this feels? I yeah. got a, somebody who made it at 57. Yeah. Somebody made it at 14. And I'm, I'm still waiting for the but train she's to on in. the rise and I'm doing a podcast. Okay, you know, but so. my train's not come in yet. <laughs> so, and the clock is ticking. Tra you're, you're, you're waiting for the Wells Fargo wagon. There's no I'm train. I'm trying to find the rails. <laughs> so later in life, hello. Leanne, welcome to our show, first of all. And Thank we are you. so happy to have you here. And I, and I am no less enamored of you than my friend Peter. However, I will tell you what it is specifically about you that gets to him. And then because he'll tear up if he does. <laughs> Peter considered his relationship with the late, great Joan Rivers. She was like another mother to him. She has meant so much to him. And what he sees when he watches you perform is a very similar, not in, not in what you talk about or the style, but he sees a woman whose success has come at, at, at a really interesting time with a similar work ethic, with an ease with people who is just talking about real things in a real way and enjoying her audience and, and all of, of the way you do what you do evokes for him such a strong connection and memory of Joan that he feels so warmly and so loving toward you, having never met you, that he, he's never <laughs> been this silent in the history of our relationship. <laughs> Go ahead. Cause it, cause it, Talk from the heart. <laughs> and we're out of time, by the way. Thanks for being with us. <laughs> Leanne Morgan, we're actually going to book. She's appearing at the, uh, the uh, tribal. For, so here's the deal. Yes. And by the way, she's not talking for the first 20 minutes of this. What great and and tell everybody, just in case somebody <laughs> tuned in. and okay. Leanne never Morgan, heard. she has the, the top comedy specials on Netflix. She's got tons of, a billion views. A YouTube sensation. YouTube sensation that happened later in life. A I book can, coming out any minute. A book now coming we'll out. She's, on, on, she's getting ready for yet another tour. And she's as big as you can be and as good as you can be. And I'm watching you and I'm going, son of a bitch. She makes it look easy, but she's brilliant. It's so good, 
th- that I just wanted to be able to Let tell you that. Let her talk. We've not important. heard two words now we're out, out of time. Her mouth. So why don't you tell everybody else how you start? How you start? How just did you get through the story? Yeah, I know. Peter, thank you for all of that, you angel. Thank you. That means a lot to me. And thank y'all for having me on. I'm nervous. We're thrilled. We're thr- oh, don't be, oh, don't be and, nervous. Oh, please. And I'm just thankful my husband's not here. I thought about that because uh, he would be weird and act weird. And I don't mean that. <laughs> I'm in a hotel room in Kansas City, Missouri. I've got a show tonight and one tomorrow night. And then I go to Minnesota. And I wanted to have on a cute top for you y'all. Look you look gorgeous. You have a stylist? Do you have a stylist now or no? Do what? Do you have a stylist? Somebody who styles I do have someone now. I do have someone now because Mm -hmm. I made a lot of missteps, Peter. (laughs) And I was on a budget raising a bunch of kids with a tight husband. Chuck Morgan was so tight. And so, yes, now I can do a little more. So, Chuck, wait, wait. Chuck doesn't let you spend. You're making money. He doesn't let you spend money? Um, not on big things. I mean, he'll say, you don't need that land. Good night. And I, but so I buy little things. I buy grandbaby things. I buy, I have to buy clothes. I have to look like somebody, but no, I'm not making big purchases, Peter. I'm not, I'm not made the biggest, uh, purchase I've made since this happened to me. And they asked me on the wall street journal and it's a playground for my grandbabies. I bought, and it's not that big a deal. It's just one of those things where it don't, it won't spoil or. You know, it's got, for little children, it won't hurt them. Right. It's the nice kind that they bring in, they build right. in your yard. Yep. I, I will just warn you, out. if it's made of the plastic stuff or the metal stuff, it's going to heat up like an inferno. I've burned many a child on those things. So. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, in yeah, the South, that. in the South, you have <laughs> stuff in your backyard that's intended to kill kids. you got trampolines. you got all kinds of stuff. You can go, oh, nothing reptiles, bad could happen. Reptiles, reptiles. An, an over, over open, oh, yeah. Unfed feral dogs, I know. No, it's it's a nervous down So there. could you tell everybody, just to get people listening up to speed, how you started with your jewelry shows and Carmen peeing and all of that, please? Okay. I met Chuck Morgan at the University of Tennessee, and we married, and he moved me to Bean Station, Tennessee, in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. All the time, though, from the time I was a child, I wanted to be in show business. You know, but life kicks you in the teeth and you you think, maybe I'm crazy. You know, I shouldn't think that or whatever. But I always had it in the back of my mind. So we go to Bing Station. I get pregnant with my first baby, Charlie, who's now 30. And I wanted to stay home with him and nurse. And Chuck Morgan ended up like for me to spend money. And that's not a shtick. I'm not kidding. Chuck, I wanted to get my hair highlighted. I wanted to buy Charlie an outfit. So, um... One of my girlfriends was selling jewelry in Nashville, Tennessee, and she goes, it's like Mary Kay or Tupperware land, and you'll make a little money, and you can stay home with Charlie. And I started selling jewelry in women's houses at night. We'd put They'd put a dip out or in a pan of brownies, and we'd eat dip. And then I started, like I developed an act. And I look back on it now, <laughs> and I think, oh, my gosh, there were no comedy clubs for 100 miles. Right. But I thought I had my own little comedy club every night, and these women thought I was funny. Carmen peed on a couch. She now works for my eye doctor. I love her. <laughs> we hold each other. Every time I see her, her husband walked off and left her, Peter. And I told her, I go, you don't understand, Carmen. It was a God thing. When you peed on that couch, it gave me the courage to go, I think I can make it. <laughs> Anyway, (laughs) women thought I was funny. They started booking my parties like a year in advance. And then the company noticed and asked me to start speaking at their big things. And so I would do, I was supposed to be talking about booking parties and I talk about breastfeeding and hemorrhoids and all that. And women would come up to me and say, you need to be a stand up. So that gave me the courage. And then I went to my first comedy club in Nashville, Tennessee and opened for Billy Gardell. And that was probably, my baby was 18 months old. She's 26. Wow. So a lot of years of, and then, of comedy clubs. A lot of years, honey. And they t- and I remember Brian Dorfman saying to me at Zanies, who is now one of my concert promoters, and I love him. And he said, Lynn, you cannot, you, you cannot do this in clubs and be a, like a stand-up, like the regular path and raise these three children. And he was right. I remember it made me mad. But he was right. So I just had to do when I could and do just a different, I had to do a different path. Yeah. So could you talk, so your big, the big thing that popped, jumping a bit ahead social media wise, which is still a thing, I explained it to Jason and I laugh as I start to talk about it, is you talking about going to the Journey concert. (laughs) 
could you take us? I know you've done it, but take us through that that video <laughs> about you forcing Chuck to take you to see. John and if you too. forget any bits yes. of the routine, Peter can fill it in for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that's what turned everything around. Right, I'm not right. kidding. I was about to quit. I thought mm -hmm. I'm going to go to work at Target, and I knew I was having a grandbaby and I, soon, and I thought. I, if this doesn't hit, I paid these two little boys, I say little boys, they were in their 20s, to do my social media. I'd been putting up pictures of dachshunds. And then <laughs> I gave them a little bit of money. Well, a lot of money to me. A lot of money. And I thought, I'm going to give it three months. And he put out, first clip was me taking Chuck Morgan to go see Def Leppard and Journey. Okay, so what I said was, in the 80s, when I went to the University of Tennessee, where we went to see Def Leppard and Journey, I was... This was the 80s. I saw Tina Turner, Rod Stewart, uh, John Cougar Mellencamp, Elton John, and I was so cute and tiny in my britches. You know, I was, I had a metabolism and my thyroid was functioning and I didn't care about food. You know, I'd eat a half a can of tuna and go, I'm full. <laughs> well, man, man, Chuck Morgan, <laughs> go to Def Leppard and Journey. First of all, I thought we were going to have a date night, and he goes, "I don't have time for that, Lynn. It was a it was a week night, so he stopped at the gas station and got a tall boy and an egg salad sandwich, <laughs> and ate that on the way. And then I he burnt. I had to smell that all night. But anyway, we get to the Thompson Bowling Arena, and everybody there was fifty and older, and everybody was at the snack bar. Journey was already on stage. Nobody cared. <laughs> Nobody cared. Everybody was at the snack bar. And I was too. I was so hungry. And I was getting a big thing of popcorn, like a big bucket of popcorn. And everybody had a big old Diet Coke. And I love a Diet Coke. And I've got to get off of them. But anyway, we were all sucking on those big Diet Cokes and finally get to the seat. And, you know, Steve Perry's not with Journey anymore, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. I love him. Yes. But they something's happened. Something's gone down. They've had a falling out. They've hired some little man who is tiny from another country who sings just like Steve Perry. It's crazy. I mean, you, if you shut your eyes, you wouldn't know it. And you could tell that little thing is in good shape. And you could tell he hasn't been eating white flour and sugar. <laughs> and he hasn't been doing dope. You know, he hasn't been taking dope no. and sleeping with nasty women like all the old boys in Journey have, you know, they all. <laughs> so that little feller is just going up and down that big stage and flipping and turning and squatting and doing. And then all those old boys in the back look sick. <laughs> and, and they're in the back just barely strumming a guitar. Uh. And then... All right, but they were wonderful. Okay, then Def Leppard comes out, that little man from Def Leppard. And and I ask people in my bit, like, when's the last time y'all saw that man? But he comes out with legs that are that big, tiny little frail legs. I've never seen legs as tiny on a man in my life. And every once in a while, he'd prop it up on a little stool, you know, and just barely go. And then he had hair down to hair, and it was thin. You could see through it. <laughs> And I thought, thyroid, you know, it's just thyroid. <laughs> I know, because I've had thyroid issues. Right, right. And then he starts singing, put some sugar on it. And that is Chuck Morgan's favorite song. And my husband is very introverted and does not talk. I've seen his teeth three times <laughs> in 30 years. <laughs> and he gets up He's doing and starts dancing. Uh-huh. And then... It's back down because his knees hurt, you know, <laughs> and joint pain. And then the whole time that little man is singing, put some sugar on it. I'm st studying his little body. And I thought, he's got a hump right here, up under here. And I thought, what is that hump? Now I thought, oh, hernia. He's got a hernia. <laughs> because I know, because I've had a hernia, boys, the same place right here I I was in my local Dancing with the Stars. I hate to even tell y'all that because y'all are big time. I was in my local Dancing with the Stars, got a hernia, popped out. I had to have emergency surgery. Anyway, they did put a mesh in mine. And I often, I thought worried about that little man, that little deaf flavored man. And I often thought, I hope during COVID, that little thing had time to get a mesh put in. <laughs> but anyway, 
<laughs> they were wonderful. We had a ball. And then all these 50 and older people start walking out of Thompson Bowling. And everybody's just barely going because we've all got plantar fasciitis <laughs> in our feet. You know? It's horrible. And the whole time I'm thinking, we got to get home. <clears throat> it's, it's 10 o'clock. What are we doing? Let's oh get to the God. car. So that's it. That's the bit. You know, what is so... It's delicious brilliant. It's brilliant. about you and Thank and you. i've seen that i've seen you do that story on the video and what is so wonderful to me and this is as an actor to a performer you know when you have to repeat material sometimes it can really go dry sometimes you know it's like a singer being asked to sing the big hit song and they go oh i'd rather chew glass than do this again but you are able to, t because they are your stories, you are able to, you're, it's like you're reliving a life event, you know, and it's, it, it, it is genuine and it is funny and there's no sense of, oh, here we go again. When, when you were talking about, you know, you were a, a kid going, I want to be in show business, I want to be in show business, was this the dream or did you think oh i'd love to be an actress i'd love to be in hollywood or i'd love to what, what were you hoping it would be versus what you are the 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 road you've taken i thought in my mind probably at nine or ten years old i want to be a movie star yeah i thought movie star but i was from a town of 500 people little farming community my people farm and i think Rural kids think of show business as all movie star, right. but I loved sitcoms and I grew up on sitcoms and, the, and that was that one, by the time I started getting into comedy and probably when I was in college before I ever tried anything, I thought, I wish I could be a sitcom star. Uh -huh. And that became my goal, you know, and I, and when I got into the business, I, but people would ask me that, you know, mentored me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go all the way. I want to be a sitcom star. And then, but I didn't, I mean, I don't even know why I even said that. Cause Lord, I only took one improv class when I was in high school, my little country in high school, let us do improv. And I loved it. And then at UT, I didn't do anything. I tried to take a theater class and this woman with a tight bun on said, everybody out of here that's not majoring in theater. And I'm a rule follower. So I didn't stay in there. And it's just crazy what I thought. But did y'all know that I've, I've done my first movie? Yes. Yes, with, with, Reese with Reese Witherspoon. What was that like? Would that yes. blow your mind? Honey. And Will Ferrell. Oh, it blew my mind. And I think little Reese Witherspoon did that for me. I met her years ago before, COVID, before the pandemic. And she and I bonded, I could tell. And I think that little thing asked somebody, for me to do a table read. And they called me and said, do you want to do a table read? And I go, what's a table read? <laughs> and I flew out there and I thought I was going to die. And Will was there, all the, Nick Stoller, all these people, and I did it. And I don't even know how in the world, but I got that thing. But And I ended up having a ball. And I really think that I'd like to do it again. By the time I got through with it, I thought, okay, I kind of know how things work. It was hard for me at first because I really was insecure because I'm used to getting a laugh. At, right. You know, and yeah. so when everybody's on the set, nobody's saying anything, that really tore me up and messed with me. But by the end of it, I thought, okay, I get it. And I, I know what's funny. I may not hit it every time, but I feel like I know what's funny. Oh, you do. And so, thank you. That's wonderful. And so, thank you. I think, I think everybody's saying it's so... Uh, cute and fun and it's going to do well they think and i just have a bit part in it i played reese witherspoon's big sister which is crazy because i outweigh her will everybody i feel like <laughs> I, I felt like it was like one big breast was the size of little reese witherspoon's little head uh, speaking of wait wait if i may this man has been through i've been best friends with him for 30 plus years he's been through 50 diets You've been through a lot of diets. You did Weight Watchers. You talk about you did De the, when you talk about Dexatrim. I completely forgot that it's speed that they were giving whole families speed, and and until you brought that up, <laughs> I, what were we thinking as a country? This will be what good for them. What were we thinking? Right. Oh, my mama, my mama, and my sister and I took it together and took it a long time, and it was speed. And I remember. In Nashville, Tennessee, because I was raised outside of Nashville, Opryland was a big amusement park, oh, and God. all the workers would take Dexatrim and then comb their hair. 
because it t- made him tingle. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Well, didn't you say that you scra- <laughs> you took Dexter Trim and scratched your head and fought in the lawn, which is like, like, you know, can you imagine the stories from America for Dexter Trim? And they're going, it's okay. We're making money. Leave it out a little bit longer before we destroy lives. Oh, my gosh. And then Weight Watcher, you did Weight Watcher. You've done a lot. I've right? done them all. Every, done like them all. everyone. Just about. And did now I'm talking like her. <laughs> just about. Um, yeah. No, I've done... Um, yeah, wait. What? I mean, I was the, I was the spokesperson for Jenny Craig. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Which and by the I've way, I've never tried Jenny. Je- th- it's great. I've never tried. I, I have not a Is bad it? thing to say about any of them. They all work if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but they. Are I just had a problem <laughs> sticking with the program because <laughs> they package a meal. It's the size of yes. when you go like this. <coughs> it's three, something comes it's up, three that's the airplane. Size. It's yeah. three airplane meals a day. Yes. That's what yes. you're eating. And yes, you no will human lose being, weight. No human if being. You, they go if the you, size of your palm. That's right. Are you right. kidding me? If you if you if you eat less calories than it takes to walk from the bedroom to the bathroom, you It'll will work. lose work. weight. But Leah, <laughs> you are so funny. I, and I'm I'm thinking you and I must might have some similar paths. When you were a kid, when you were younger, when you were a kid. Did you know you were funny? Did you think of yourself as being a funny person? I did. You did. See, I, I did. You strike me as someone who people said, "You know, you're funny," and you went, "I, I am." Um, I, I'm. I'm surprised. So, how, like, how did you know you were funny as a little kid? Were Were, were, were you the family delight? <laughs> I was. I was. I, I was raised around all my grandparents and aunts and uncles, and and they just thought I was so cute and fun and they would tell me and I was a ham and I and let me tell you why I'm I'm embarrassed to even say that because I've been looking through pictures that I'm going to include in my book yeah and every picture I'm going to die I mean I'm a little kid doing and I'm like somebody should have slapped my teeth out I mean everything was you know, I was trying to tap, and I didn't know how to tap because I didn't get to take tap lessons. We were that rural. But, um, but yeah, I, w- I, I would be funny at school. The teachers would say, Liam, will you MC this event? Will you do the announcements? I always, I found any way I could. And I, I know I was clown. You know I talked too much. What's so interesting to me about that, and I don't, uh, there are two things I'm about to do, and I don't mean any of them in, in the wrong way. I, I'm going to make a comment about how you look, and I'm going to make a general comment about women. You are a beautiful woman. I think by anybody's definition, you are a beautiful, attractive woman, and I have to imagine that when you were younger, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you were just a knockout. It was, it's unusual for young women of our age, because you're just a little younger than me, the, the, I always found that the really beautiful girls were afraid to put out a sense of humor, thinking that it would expose them in some way as being goofy or silly or, or somehow crack the attractiveness. But you, it seems like you were either unaware of, of being a, a, a attractive or had nothing on it. Well, I did... I, my mama would say, oh, you're a movie star. You're going to be a movie star. And I felt pretty too. And, but I did worry. I did worry at times that if I was really funny, I wouldn't be as pretty. Like if I made bad faces or yeah. whatever, because I make a lot of faces and I, but now, I mean, good night. Now I'm 58 and, I, and it doesn't bother me at all. But I think when I was in clubs in front of an audience that really weren't fans of mine, they were drunk. It was a lot of men. It would make me feel weird, yeah. and it would. And I probably didn't emote and, and use expression like I would now. Mm. I think I did kind of dumb it, not dumb it down. What would it be? You know, just not. Be, yeah, just not, I mean, not I swing for the fences too. in the same way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get it. The yeah. other, the other thing that you do yeah. that's that's really something is you're clean. The act is clean. So when you do. Chuck Morgan, by the way, I love that you use his full name every time you say his name, <laughs> Chuck Morgan. That already is a home run. But when you say, yeah, Chuck would do this, I think you're talking about the five love languages. And if he did it right, then I would do dirty, uh, unmentionable things to him, which leaves the audience to take their mind to the dirty, which is even funnier. Because every time you say unmentionable, I forget. How many ways do you say 
doing sex. I unspeakable, mean, uh, unspeakable, or vulgar, or you know, something <laughs> nasty to him. If he buys me something, I'm, then I guess I'm forced to do something vulgar to him, and the entire audience goes nuts because they insert insert what you're thinking insert there, which is here. worse than yeah, right. anything you can make, which is wonderful. And you also relate to the you talk to the audience a lot about the younger girls. The, the, the poor girls, you don't know what's coming. It's like the disaster that's going to hit you yeah. later in life. Like per, the, odd, the, the wonder of perimenopause. I think you said, and the phrases you use when your kids left home, I took to the bed. I mean, I, that's foreign to me. My family never talked that way, but I got it. Nor did Jimmy Jones with your beagles pushing his butt, his butthole up to your head. Everybody has that. Everybody has that experience. But the way you put it, and the fact that it's real, that you got two beagles in the bed, <laughs> two beagles in the bed, your husband, no one's really happy at this point. You're finding out that he's home. And I think you talked about COVID, that he was home and all of a sudden he gave you to-do lists and then you get to really know who he is. That must have been a shock, right? It was a shock, which I've always known he was ballsy. And he's very <laughs> anal retentive and, you know, and very clean and so opposite from me. And I and made straight A's, and I barely got out of school. And but he thought I was pretty, and he was on fire for me, and stalked me. And I'm finding these pictures in this book of how he would look at me. But then you know you're married to somebody for a long time, and then you start to resent them for the things you fell in love with them for. Like he thought I was artistic, and you know, funny, and talked all the time. He didn't have to talk. Now he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that's normal. But yeah, Chuck Morgan. Yeah, he was at home during the pandemic, and he is a real, yeah. When I say he really put a kink in things, when the, he traveled all of our married life for, it, with his company, and then these kids and I had a ball without him. <laughs> and I, I mean, but that's the truth. You know, we ate hot dogs and went to Sonic at night. We had a ball. I've let him go to Zoom. You know what, I, I mean, again, I every like, family I think <laughs> relates to that. If you said to my wife, so when Peter was really busy and working and doing TV and radio and stuff, what was that like? And she will smile and think back how wonderful that was. <laughs> and then when I'm home, it changes her whole routine. And you're asked, you're starting to ask questions. Like there's interrogation. It becomes an interrogation. Why are you doing that? How are you doing that? And I think your line was, you let him know, I don't get up till the third out or GMA. You'd like kind of draw on the line. <laughs> Take your to-do list and shove it up your, it's not happening. It's not happening. But it is a shock. It's oh, a different no. person. So, and do, how does he relate to your, you're doing a hundred, you did a hundred dates on the, the panties tour. On Big Panty. So uh -huh, you're gone a lot. Tour. That must throw the equilibrium of the relationship off quite a bit. Because then he's used to being home. Now you're a star. All the attention, forget Chuck. Yeah, they don't want to talk to you, Chuck Morgan. It's me. How does that impact the relationship at this point? Well, he has been a wonderful breadwinner. And, uh, I think also it took him a long time to figure out what was happening. Cause I kept saying something's happening, Chuck. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you closed the garage door? You know, he <laughs> didn't even understand yeah. what was happening. And, and the big panty tour, the whole time it was hundred cities. It was very successful. And he was like, well, it could end tomorrow. You, we don't need to be spending any money or we don't need to do it because it could end tomorrow. Well, then I got my second tour. I'm on that right now called the just getting started tour. And, um, and then I got a movie and then I got a book deal and then, you know, I, and I'm like, Chuck, it's happening. But, but let me, I think he's finally caught up, but he's at first he was saying we're out of dog food. And I remember one day just saying, Chuck, I'm sorry, but you're the mom now. Like you're going to mm. have to go and get the mm. dog food because I can't do all, I did everything. I did everything. And I wanted to, I loved being a mama. And being a stay-at-home mom, and I love taking care of him. I love taking care of our house, all that. And I just said, Chuck, I can't. I mean, I can't do it. I got to be out here doing. But I tell people this because they do worry about him, and they go, "Is Chuck all right with all this?" He wants me to work like a mule. <laughs> all these children, everybody, all of his life, he's a worker. He's Type A. He thinks everybody ought to be working and suffering. And, you know, he's like an old-time dad, you know? Suffering. Everybody ought to be out driving old cars. All that on Netflix that I said is true. I drove a 2007 Honda Pilot. I don't even know how long. I mean, until lights started flashing in it, and they were like, you've got to get out, Lynn. You can't drive it anymore. <laughs> he drives the 2007 Tahoe. 
that's got T and the A missing, and it just says Ho on it. And he goes, I don't care about that. My agent. My, <laughs> that's all true. And my agent said, Lynn, go go over there to that Range Rover in Knoxville and just right, get something. And I and I'm thinking, oh Lord, I can't do that. I mean, I'm a, I got an okay car right now. I'm fine. <laughs> but, I mean, I, we just don't even live like that. And I said to him, I go, Chuck, I think I'm not going to be living in this neighborhood. I'm I'm living in the house that I raised my children in. And there's already been people, like, come up in the yard that know who I am. You know, like, oh, you man. Google somebody's address. And I'm like, I think we need to move. He goes, oh, my gosh. We don't need to move. So, he's still, he's lagging behind. Oh, hold on. But, you know, Leah, this is, a bi- this is a big thing. Now, I was lucky enough that my success came in stages and I was able to more or less adjust. I mean, Seinfeld was a big jump and, and it turned my head around for a while too. You know, that put me in therapy for a good number of years, but, <laughs> uh, but I, it was incremental throughout my teens and twenties and thirties and forties. Your life has taken a huge shift. So it's clear to me you're dealing with it beautifully and you've talked a little bit about how Chuck is dealing with it, but how do your kids and your friends and your extended family, how has life and the perception of you changed for them? And is this fame, is this notoriety everything you hoped it would be? Um, everybody is still kind of lagging behind. I mean, I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee, you know, mm-hmm. with a bunch of, Darling friends who love me no matter what. I'm very lucky. Reese Witherspoon would say on set every day to our little sister, played our little sister, Meredith Hagner. You, she said, Lynn got to raise her own children. <laughs> you, Meredith, you need to get somewhere and raise your children and, and get out of the Hollywood scene because yeah. you need community. And I didn't have community until I moved to, not, to Nashville is what Reese said. And I, it, may, it dawned on me how, what they really meant all by that. I got to have a normal life. I have normal friends. They love me no matter what. They don't care. They don't. I, I really am lucky about that. Um, uh, yeah, everything is okay. It's like kind of normal like it's always been. Mm-hmm. And then, and what was the last thing you asked well, me, Jason? I just people, went boring. For some people, uh, so you did discuss about how it, it hasn't really affected your community so much, but People have expectations of what fame is going to look like and feel like and how they're going to be different. And is it is it shaping up to be something you hoped it would be or is it different? How, how does it feel for you? It feels weird. And I think I really had a hard time when it hit. I really went. I probably should have been in therapy. I, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. I thought I don't deserve this. And I can't even though I've been doing this for ever and i've you know i've had television deals that didn't make it and i've had ups and downs times i couldn't get arrested times when i was on top of the world it felt like i was getting booked i was on tours not like i am now but yeah. and then other times where nobody cared and uh, so i know i'm i know i'm supposed to be here i know i i mean i put in work i know that yeah. but it i felt like an imposter at first it really messed with my head and i wish i journaled because i um, I put little Karen Mills who opens for me, who we've, we've traveled on and off since 2004 together. And we would help each other get gigs through the years. And I put her through torment. I've sat and said, I don't know about this. What? I mean, did that <laughs> suck? I suck. Was that, I mean, this material is stupid. She was like, no, it's not. So I went through a lot yeah, yeah. during the beginning of it. And now I kind of settled into it. And I feel like I do get nervous, like Netflix is a joke. I'll be in that festival. That'll probably mess with me because that's Bill Burr, Chris Rock, all these people. And I'll think, oh. And now also, Jason, I'm a, the only 58-year-old grandmama yeah, in right. this bunch. Yeah. You know, I mean, when the, you think about the women in comedy, Chelsea Handler, yeah. Amy Schumer, um, all those kind of, Wanda Sykes. I mean, there's nobody that's a grandmama at 58 talking about menopause you know i'm and i think i'm lucky that way because i can talk about anything it doesn't bother me i'm you know i don't feel like i need to be a hollywood starlet anymore i used to but um but the fame part of it i thought uh, yes it's good to have the money that i know we can 
give to our children and, yeah. and everybody doesn't have to worry and all that. But did I think, I mean, I thought it was going to be, make me happier than this. I guess I, I think I'm just getting to an age where it just doesn't matter to me. You know, I used to, when I was 40, I used to dream of having a big house with like nine commodes in it. <laughs> now I'm thinking, I don't need all those commodes. Yeah. You know, I don't want yeah. all that. Yeah, who's going to clean all of those toilets? So that's yeah, it. Really. Toilets is really stardom. Yeah. That kind of defines it. How many yeah. toilets does a star have? Yeah, is is the answer. <laughs> I'm curious about the material because when you get bigger too, the the what happens is you write material based on what you know. When you're doing a hundred city tour, and then you're doing a movie, and then you're doing a book, you're not living the life that you lived when you were coming up with all that material and had and quiet and could be introspective. Are you having trouble with new material, knowing where to go with it, or? Because nothing's talking to not you, so or, is, or are you still, are you not, still, oh, well, no. not so far, but I think it's because I have had this full life with a bunch of kids. I've got grandbabies now, two grandsons. Um, I've got Chuck Morgan, and Chuck Morgan's peculiar, and he gives me stuff every day. <laughs> but I also, like, my kids will go, Mom. You never told the story about the outfit that Dad brought you to the hospital when I was born. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So they all kind of helped me. <laughs> right. And I have lived a full life. Yeah. So I can say, you know, go back to and pull mine from, because I have, you know, I am a, a mom. Do they allow you and to I, talk about them? I am them? going to menopause. Yeah. Do they allow you to talk yeah. about them? Or or do they get really upset? And Because so, yeah, I think there was a story about your son where he said, never talk about me again on stage. Were you embarrassed him or something about his hair? Um, well, when he was 13 and I started, I was on the radio in Knoxville, Tennessee and the, he was, uh, at school already. And I was talking about him going through puberty and I, and I think I said, he sounds like Johnny Cash, his <laughs> voice and he, and one hair, he's got one hair under this arm and nothing under this arm. And but darn, if some little boy he went to school with has had an orthodontist appointment and heard it. On the way to school, and Charlie said, don't ever. So middle school, they said, do oh. not speak my name out yeah, of your mouth. Yeah. And I didn't. I didn't. They, I got, they got real, you know, and I understood that. And there was one time Chuck Morgan said, years ago when I first got started, I said something about I wanted to get my breasts done because I breastfed all these children. But it's been a bad mobile home year. And he said, because he sells mobile home, <laughs> is in the mobile home industry. And he goes, don't you? Never say that you know that I'm a good father and I could write a check for your breast right now. <laughs> so I never said anything about that again. Uh, but now, but now they're all like, we don't care, mom. Money. They say see the money. We're selling out stadiums. Screw yeah. it. Screw it. We want mom. You know, the, the best thing too, that I love the most about what you do is that you brought the family out at the end. The, the real family that you see everybody come out and you go, because there's an authenticity to your act. And that just does it. It just fine. It's a nice act. I had learned years ago from a, a manager, a comedy manager, who managed some of the biggest talent and became like a family member who said, we didn't sign him and we didn't sign them because it was just jokes, but they didn't leave anything on the stage. It's important that when the audience leaves, it's not just about the jokes, that they feel something. And you leave a lot on the stage. So that's, that's the whole thing has a, a finality to it where you go, I'm rooting for her. I'm rooting for her family because I know all the characters. It's pretty amazing. So you leave thank a lot you. on the stage, you know, and I think What's, that's your thank success. Thank you, my darling. What is, because um, I know we have to wrap up soon. What, what, what's, what's the dreams now? What are you, what are you, what are you hoping? You know, it's so funny when, when still... we're younger, we have, we have crazy big dreams, but now, you know, you've lived so much of your life and, and what, what do you, wh where does this become? Fantasy. I would like to keep going. I don't think I want to go. I think I could, I really and truly think that I could have, you know, five more years and then just sail off into the sunset. I really do. I think I could, I know I've got, uh, my girls have not married yet and had children. I know that I'm going to have more grandchildren. I think that I could bow out of this thing and be fine. But it, until then, I do think I would like to do another movie. I really had a good time. And we laughed and had a good time. And I and I also, I still have that television show idea. I mean, or just that idea of what success is for as a comedian. So I would really like to try that. Well, I'm going to tell but, you, you know, something. Nowadays, I mean, we can do this. We can do this on mic or off mic. If there's a place for me in your sitcom world, I want to be there, <laughs> either behind the scenes or standing there next to you, because you would be 
a joy to work. I just get, you know, not only from what I've seen you do in your work, but just spending this little bit of time with you in this abstract Zoom way, you were... It, to be a colleague of yours, I would imagine, would be great, great fun because your heart shines through in all of this. And I only want to work with people who have that kind of heart because I'm old and I just want lovely people around <laughs> to play with. So um, I'm serious. If there's ever a way that Peter and I can help you get one of your dreams. Oh, yeah, I'm going to help forward. her. She's selling stadiums. and I'm, You know more people than I do at this point. And you know what I want? My dream is that you two work together and I get 10% of it for the rest, <laughs> for the rest of my life without having to show up. Because that's where I'm at in my life. I don't want to work that hard. I've done sitcoms. I've done all this stuff. I've had executives tell me that's not funny. This is... We had to sit come together. I ended up in intensive care. That's true. It almost killed yeah, me. On ABC. It almost oh, killed it almost him. killed me. So, yeah, be careful so what you I wish for. I would rather there. just take your commission and say, take credit for it. Like the 800 people say, I put friends on the air. You meet in Hollywood, you meet every other person you meet. Yeah, you know, I'm, all the guy, I'm the guy friends. who put friends yeah, on the air. Exactly. And you go, yeah, yeah, go, go away. So you're you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere yet. Yeah, hey, I know you're mad. Get ready. It's going to be a little more than five years yeah. for you, my darling. You're going to have a lot of opportunities. <laughs> Could you do one thing for me? Though it's like I hate doing this because I'm handing you. Can you sing piano, man? Before you, <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're going to. You know it's the guy from Journeys you know, on the line. He wants to talk to you. What's I, that? I just watched You Are the World last night. On Mm, Netflix. Right. Sing my yet. Yes, it's fantastic, isn't it? Bob Dylan fantastic. trying to mumble his yeah. way through We Are the yeah. World. Stevie hey, Wonder hey. teaching Bob Dylan how to be Bob Dylan. It was fantastic. <laughs> and there were some people, they're not to name them. Go, you talk imposter syndrome. There were one or two people in there going, uh oh, I think I got off the wrong bus stop. Yeah, really. Like, this is not. <laughs> oh, they this, want real singers. This is not my bus stop. But before we go, just because <laughs> there's something positive for the audience to hear this, because it's, uh, uh, it's helpful. It's the love language, the five love languages that you, you had learned is one of my favorite things because yeah. it's just so helpful to people to know about the five love languages. Oh, do you want me to do Yes, that if you would just talk, if you just, well, if you, if you don't If mind. you don't feel like a performing seal, that would oh, be no, that I, I'm fine, dude. <laughs> look, look. I'm just long-winded. And y'all are going to be like, we're oh, good. We're good. forever to tell us something. All right, I met that little man, Gary Chapman, who wrote that, and he is in his late 80s or 90s and is darling. Um, and that is one of the top books that's ever been in print, and it still is. But, okay, five love languages. There's prominent love, love language, and you have to read the book and take the test. I didn't read the book. I don't read. I mean, I do, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, I get it. we get it. We get it. you know, okay. So you take the test, and you find out what your prominent love language is. And there's, um, and then you can think, you find out your spouse's love language and then that way you can feed that to them they can feed you your love language at night on the couch and then your love tank feels full if you don't say your husband goes to work and is at a water fountain his love tank is empty some whore <laughs> swoops in and feeds him his love language and gives him a tingle okay <laughs> and that's when satan <laughs> swoops in. I believe that. Satan swoops in. And that's when terrible things happen. Okay. The pro five prominent love languages. Gifts. That's like my sister. She It's gifts. You could get her a, a rose and a card from a grocery store and she'd ball her eyes out. Okay. And then there's physical touch. Uh, that's a lot of women go, oh, my husband, that's physical touch. I'm not talking about, you know, physical nasty. And I know they're thinking... My husband's on me like a duck on a gym bug. I'm not talking about that kind of nasty. I'm talking about physical touch where you, people just want to hold hands and squeeze. Y'all know people that just, yeah. you know, love language yes. is physical touch. Then there's quality time. That's somebody wants you to sit and watch ESPN or something with them. That kind of quality time. Words of affirmation, that is mine. So all Chuck Morgan has to say is, Leanne, you are a beauty. Leanne, that Ch Trisha Yearwood's chicken piccata is to die for. And then I'm willing to do something nasty to him. <laughs> and then he gives me money to get my hair highlighted. <laughs> so there it works, and it works. Okay, and there and it works. Okay, and then Chuck Morgan's love language is acts of service. That's the fifth one, which is really unfair because that means that I have to go and build a set of shelves in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? You're great. The last question, and then, you, and then we'll let you escape, is I've heard so often, we've heard so often in our life, you know, I'm so glad that my success happened later in life because when I was young, 
I would not have been able to, to, to deal with it. Um, and I'm curious, do you agree with that? Or are you saying, screw that? Yes. Yes, 100%? Yes. I would have been an idiot. <laughs> I was already an idiot. Yeah. I was an idiot in my 20s. Y'all would have, oh, I mean, I dated people y'all wouldn't wipe your feet on. <laughs> I mean, I did horrible things. Horrible things. In the 80s, I was, oh, and, um, and Chuck Morgan swooped in and saved me, I guess. But, oh. If I had had money and I've been around them, it's no telling what would happen to me. I did not have any sense until I had my first baby. And then it was just like, okay. I, and then I, I feel like I woke up, but oh no, I could. And you know what? I see these young girls and guys that have got specials that have hit on Netflix and they're touring. They've got the same people I've got. And I think how to, to think that you've got to sustain that, you know, those ticket sales, all that kind of stuff yeah. for, 40, I mean, 30, 20 years, right. yeah, 20, wow. 30 years. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think they're strong. They can probably do it. I I just don't think I could do it. I think this is the best thing, best timing that That's could great. have ever That's happened great. to me at 51, 52. Well, congratulations. You are, you've hit it huge. You deserve it. And you should watch your special. I'm and telling you, got, I haven't seen anything that good. And, and I've been around, we've been around a lot of comedians. Yeah. We've worked with a lot of comedians, the top comedians. And I haven't seen anything that good, that funny. And that makes you feel, like I said, leaving something on the stage. When I turn it off, you're with me. So this was a big thing. And I'm a fan, but if anything happens to Chuck Morgan, here's your, <laughs> no, here's your, yeah. Brett, there's your yeah, money yeah, ticket I'm right the here. Magic. I'm this the is magic. The, this is the guy. This is the magic. <laughs> oh, you want to be, call my wife right now and she'll tell you how magical. He must be really funny at home. Oh, yeah, he's, a, he's hilarious. Yeah, he's a riot. Yeah, he's so fantastic. we get it. Have a wonderful performance tonight. Oh. And a wonderful oh, tour. Y'all have lifted me up. Thank you. Well, oh, and the book, the book should delight. be a huge success. And we will talk again if you're not. They'll go. Yeah, yeah. she's. Listen, not, you know, not we gave Taylor Swift her big break, and we've had yeah, nothing ever yes, since. Yes, so yes. I, this is probably the last time we'll speak. See you later. It was a pleasure <laughs> no, knowing no, you. No. And yeah, they want a VIP I backstage be thing. You're the you're best. The best. I was, this was so good. I mean, I was so happy for Thank this. You're y'all so have truly welcome. lifted me up. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you.